I'm gonna just be bulking out, but there is a few tools I wanna talk about. I love these rakes. It's a, it's a square tool, you can get them around, and it's got little teeth, and that just helps guide you as you work. This, wouldn't wanna live without this. I get this at Reynolds, and um, I'm not sure who the manufacturer is, but this thing is good, because you set the height you want, and then you cut through the clay. So when you're doing dams and like this, I can just keep layering on the clay. And the most important is this clay, wet clay. Now there are other clays you can use and they'd be all right. Um, wet clay is the choice of the professionals when it comes to water-based clay. Now there's, there's reason you use oil-based clays and, and things uh, when you're working on a plaster bust or something. This stuff is the best. Walter E. Disney is what that stands for, wed clay. So you just start by cutting off chunks of clay and wrap it around. This is a metal armature, but it could just as easily have been a, a wooden armature. There's, there, it, for, for the amount of work this thing's doing, we like metal because um, it's pretty easy for us to do, but wood would be just fine, especially when it doesn't have to hold anything up. It's just sitting on the, the ground. Another thing to consider is normally we'll, I'll put a block of clay on and maybe let it set overnight, something like that, to harden up and it just gives you more grab, um, but it, you have to be careful to make sure that it's not gonna get in your way at all. Um, and then you hit hard clay, and you wanna make sure you don't, you don't make an armature that's gonna get in your way, but this armature is very simple because all we're worried about is just get, get something to hold on the clay so it doesn't slip or fall off when it's being transported but it really is, uh, we're not asking much out of the thing. Size is important, um, and just for the record, when you're choosing uh, how big to make it, just assume you're gonna have some shrink. Now we have a little extra shrink because we go in with um, foam masters and, and so we can replicate molds. So we've got an extra generation. So I have to allow, oh, maybe six, 7% shrink. Um, uh, normally, if you're gonna make it out of the original mold, you only have to allow for a few percent shrink, but also the thickness of the rubber is something you consider, like when you're doing a mass, there'll be some thickness of the rubber. So that's a pretty common mistake that people make the thing too, too uh, small, and then by the time you get the thickness of the rub rubber, the shrink of the rubber, and it's like, ah, I can't get it on my head. Or, and the, a lot of times people use like a wig stand or something to start with, and that's not good. It's, uh, you need, you need some, some room. So I'm just, I, you know, I'm not, I haven't thought too much about size probably should get a foam master in here of one of the other characters. Get a good size reference. Now when you first started sculpting in the 70s, right? In the late 70s or? Well, I started sculpting in uh, the 60s. I sculpted a Frankenstein on a wig stand, of course, nobody knew what to do back then, uh, uh, in, in oil-based clay, and uh, I was 14 when I did that. Let's see. You ain't got much of a span between his jaw and his rear. 
So we do scary a lot here at Distortions. What is the difference when you're trying to tackle a little bit of cute, a little bit of friendly? Well, the lines are a big deal when you're trying to do something cute. Because in scary, um, lines are more toward the horizontal. So if you, here's your eyes. So if you were trying to do something like friendly, you want to make those eyebrows like this. And of course, the smile is like that. But if you want to make him mean, you, you change that angle. And he's not so happy. And he might be even ready to bite you. And so it's, it's, it's more about vertical lines. And of course, when you s scream, these lines are totally vertical. And that's why Yoda's so cute. And you know, it's, it's got all these wrinkles across here. And then they even brought out his ears like this to emphasize cute. And that's what we did with Greeley Gremlin. I don't think I was thinking that consciously, but I'm beefing up horizontal lines. Now, granted, these hair things are vertical, but they're not, you know that's not his expression. This is his expression. It's, it's not so much the eyeballs, but the skin around the eyes. Um, and this puffs up when you're, when you're smiling, when you're frowning, these lines get straighter or screaming and this, this puff goes down, little stuff like that. And you know, if you just look at pictures, um, they'll tell you, you know, what, you know, find something that's similar to the expression you want. It may not be, you may be creating a new character, so you won't have that um, luxury, but, but uh, you can certainly catch the vibe of a, of a character from other sources. Mm. Uh, also, I will say, and Tom will have his own advice um, on things, but don't, a classic mistake that happens, even the pros, they rush to detail because you know, they like to bring the thing to life and you just can't do that. You've got to get that large anatomy and medium anatomy because if you rush to detail, then you're not, it's not going to look right and you'll have, a, you'll have all this work, hours of work, getting it all. And then it's like, oh, he's misshapen. Well, then all those hours of work that you put into detail are lost or what also happens if people say, eh, I'm not redoing it, I'm done, you know, and that's too bad because then your monster is not all that he could have been. And, and so don't get in a hurry. You, enjoy every process. And it, actually, large anatomy is, it, sometimes it's a little frustrating, but it's very rewarding when you get you get it, the, those shapes right. It's just, it comes to life. Large anatomy is critical. In fact, I've seen a lot of sculptures that, eh, they're not too, the, the small detail isn't good, but the large anatomy is, is right there. It looks great. Let's see. Another thing that um, is really important is to keep looking at your reference. And if you just keep looking at the sculpture, you're going way off and you don't even realize it. And, you know, to keep going back to that reference, he is fat. So I'm not sure how big the eyes are yet. I'm thinking it's gonna be these bigger ones. Again, this is a baby thing. Babies have big eyes in,
comparison to their uh, face. Um, the eyes don't shrink as much. And I'm just going to clear out some of this clay so that I don't have to push so hard to get them in. Now, Tom may feel like I've gone too big with the eyes, or I may hear in a minute, but we'll give it a shot. And these, you can just, um, you can get wood balls like at Hobby Lobby or something like that. And, um, and then we cast, cast the wood balls in um, silicone so that I can make duplicates in plastic. The plastic's better. I... But I'm sure Tom will want to put it on a Lazy Susan because <laughs> not only is it helpful when you're working on the back, it's very helpful to look at a character from the side because you can be sculpted in a human face and it's like, oh, it looks pretty good. And you go sideways, oh man, it's totally flat. And that, again, think of a face as an egg. It's kind of egg shape with the bigger part on top, the smaller there. If you look from the top, it's kind of egg shaped on top. And um, look at, you know, if you look in bird's eye view, it's uh, those details are super critical. What are you trying to do now? I'm trying to <clears throat> flesh out his belly a little bit. Um, Cause that's kind of the part of him that's gonna make him cute. Fat little baby. It's, it's pretty well roughed in, and I'm not sure if he's gonna disagree with um, some of the, like the eye size and stuff, so it might be good to get him in here. You might call Marsha and have her page Tom and tell him. Howdy, howdy. Tom, you're up. Are you ready to go see the mutant? Yeah, absolutely. The mutant baby? Mutant baby. It's got to be a cute baby, and a lot of what makes the mutant the mutant is, um, you know, not having friendly features. Um, so, for me, I think the 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 tricky part and kind of the goal would be to to have it be recognizable as the mutant without being quite so vicious. Um, one of the things that has always stood out to me about the mutant almost instantly is the bone structure, especially around the eyes, the cheekbones and stuff like that. Um, that's distinct and very aggressive for a baby. We could certainly make the nose more, more buttony and cute, but yeah, that's a challenge to make a baby of this. We can make a baby of it, but it's got to be Cute and friendly. Oh, Tom, there you are. Got a mutant head. So look, I 
I got carried away, Tom. I got I got other lines work uh, line share of the work done. I'm almost done. There's a few wrinkles left. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, sorry about that. There's not much for you to do. Oh, that's all right. I'll find something. He needs he needs a lot of help. <laughs> um, so just to let you know where I just pulled these legs out. The legs, I don't want those legs to be quite that long, mm -hmm. but I had them way too short by the time I started filling out his belly. Um, so the belly is kind of a big focus of him being cute. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a little, I think I got a little carried away in the belly. He looks a little fat, a little <laughs> wide. You're thinking bad thoughts, aren't you? I'm not saying no nothing. I know you're not saying it. I can tell by your face, like, what the? But anyway, it's just rough. It'll yeah. help you. Absolutely. Um, it'll help you get going because, you know, the clay's on and so forth. But, yeah, he does not look right yet. <laughs> okay, now, so these eyes, I used the biggest ones we had. Mm -hmm. And those may be too big. You might want to go to smaller. But, you know, as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, well, yeah. Those are pretty big eyes. So, all right, Tom, your uh, problem child is all yours. So, you know, we'll, we'll certainly see what what Ed's opinions are, but, um, you know, my thought just coming down here, looking at it, looking at the picture, um, is that he's a little wide and a little short in his torso, especially. Um, in fact, I think that sculpturally his his torso is wider than it is tall which is uh you know not the case in the drawing so that's probably going to be one of the first areas that i tackle um and i'm probably gonna gonna do something a little drastic here we're gonna go ahead and just bring this around Hope that doesn't panic too much. Okay. Go on with some of this. Just a little bit of padding. So, I mean, people might be surprised sometimes big changes can be made like that. Oh my gosh, yeah, well, and, you know, it, it doesn't even have to be at these at these early stages. Sometimes we do drastic stuff like that um, when a sculpture is visually near completion um, for, for any number of reasons. You know, it can be one of those things where we think everything looks all right, and then we see it finish and, of course, realize that something has gone wrong. Um, and, you know, one of the really, really nice things about doing something like this, where me and Ed kind of kind of piggyback and take turns on a sculpture, is um, the, the sculpture constantly has a fresh set of eyes on it. When you've been staring at something for too long, you might not notice the things that are off about it. Um, and, and you know, for, for, for those of you sculpting at home, get someone to look at, a, at your sculpture as you're working on it. Um, even if it's not an artistic person that's, that's gonna look at it, um, a, a fresh set of eyes makes all the difference in the world. Um, so, uh, you know, like, if I'm sculpting something by myself even, uh, you know, of course, Ed and Marsha will come down to take a look at it and see how everything is looking. Um, and usually by that point, I've been staring at the sculpture anywhere between eight and 20 hours. Um, so I'm not seeing it at face value anymore. I'm seeing uh, the work that I've done on it. Um, and that's, that's a problem because then you it can be a lot more difficult to see what needs to change. Okay. 
So I think that's starting to look a little bit closer to the proportions we have here. It's got a little bit more of a jaw in the drawing. We don't want him to have too much. He's a baby. He's not, you know, a fully formed critter, but he's got a little bit going on there. Of course, on the actual mutant, you know, he's got kind of an underbite. Um, and so ours won't be nearly as drastic as that, but you know, at, at the present moment, he's got a little bit of an overbite. So I think that might be something that needs to, needs to be changed. But Ed's done all the work for me, so this is okay. You, you could have the most brilliantly detailed sculpture in the world. If the anatomy is wrong, it's going to look wrong. And you, you know, and some of the, some of the like fine art bronze sculptures, a lot of them are left almost crude and unrefined with lots of tool marks and stuff like that. Um, and that works because the form and the shape is where it is supposed to be. And so it's visibly, you, you know, anyone could look at it and say, wow, that's a good sculpture. Um, because the, the knowledge of shape is there. And monster babies are a very good practice to learn knowledge of shape. Especially if you've only, if you only ever sculpted adult monsters, you know, you're not giving yourself the opportunity to practice uh, how anatomy changes over time. You know, uh, if you look at like a, a puppy versus a full grown dog, their proportions are so wildly different. Um, and it, it's almost kind of a, a rule of biology, not all the time, but where, where young animals have, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, bigger craniums in, uh, in proportion to the rest of their face and larger eyes and you know, larger ears or smaller ears. Um, but there are, are rules of biology that become present in babies. Um, understanding of those, those rules of, of how nature builds things allows you to create more natural sculptures. Is that sort of carving out the gum line or the... Yeah, so um, just kind of getting a little bit of definition uh, in between the lips and what will eventually be the gums. Um, you know, of course it's rough, um, but it's kind of starting to give a little definition to some of these shapes. This is kind of where we're starting to get into um, making it look like the mutant, but not being horrific like the mutant. Um, we've got a very kind of um, unique cheekbone shape here. It's got this kind of downward point to it. Um, and that is one of the things that I think uh, makes the mutant feel like what it is. I think it's one of the more prominent features that it has. So, and this may even be too much, but you can see just kind of getting a little bit of that, that shape into the baby's cheekbone, of course, not as exaggerated and getting this roundness to the eye socket starts to make it feel a little bit more like it could be the cute baby version of the movie. I was thinking when I think cute monsters, I mean, obviously even the Henri gremlins, 
are somewhat cute. The critters were somewhat were cute. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, and they obviously were pretty vicious. Oh yeah. And that's that's the the real fun about you know a character like this guy or um, I think his name was Rexy, the one from last year, the little T Rex and. Chuby is there, you know, they're mischievous. They've got these little devious grins and furrowed brows. And so you get to add that personality into the character. And, you know, um, yeah, certainly child and cute is not synonymous with, with friendly. Do you sort of tackle one side more sometimes and then do the other side? Or yes. can it go? Yes, I absolutely do. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of sculptors that would be correct in telling you not to do that. Um, it is referred to as, as half sculpting. Um, and the reason it's strongly suggested not to do it is because it is so much more difficult to develop your symmetry when you've got one side much further along than the other. Um, I personally advocate for doing it sometimes um, for a couple reasons. Um, because it's more difficult, it gives you an opportunity to improve upon your symmetry. Um, and on, you know, commercial jobs when you're, when you're sculpting for a, a living, especially, or even when you're doing it at home, um, a lot of times you're, you're kind of finding the sculpture as you go and working more heavily on one half gives you the opportunity to see what you're doing before you make a serious commitment to doing it over the entire thing. It's a, it's a good practice to not be in, but it can be a useful tool. For sure. The teeth make a big difference. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, and it, it, of course everything's very rough right now, but it's just, uh, you know, getting that, that kind of personality and seeing the character. Uh, a lot of times I'll put a little clay on the eye in the shape of whatever the pupil or iris is going to be. You know, it's not perfect and it's not uh, a great indication of what it will be like when it's painted, but it does give you the opportunity to um, see the character that you're working on with a little more life. teeth make a big difference. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, and it, it, of course everything's very rough right now, but it's just, uh, you know, getting that, that kind of personality and seeing the character. Uh, a lot of times I'll put a little clay on the eye in the shape of whatever the pupil or iris is going to be. You know, it's not perfect and it's not uh, a great indication of what it will be like when it's painted, but it does give you the opportunity to um, see the character that you're working on with a little more life.
So that little snake became the bottom gums. Yes. Yeah, just kind of a little something. This can and will all change pretty wildly from the from this point to the time that it's a uh, a finished sculpture and that that is as it should be um i think early on a lot of sculptors myself included can be really hung up on the idea of of changing something um especially if you like what is happening with the sculpture um but um i i think it's very important to you know, develop a relationship with the sculpture where you understand that it's just clay. Uh, you know, it can and will change and it should. Um, especially if something isn't quite right. Yeah. This stage where we're just kind of finding the shapes and uh, figuring figuring everything out, um, I bounce around a lot from area to area. Um, but as we approach the the finished piece, uh, you know, when we start doing detailing and polishing and that sort of thing, I uh, I like to switch it over to much more of a um, piece by piece, so I'll finish the head completely, and then I'll finish the arms completely. Um, and the, for me, the rhyme or reason to that is just, uh, it feels good to finish something. Um, and that can, can keep you motivated when you're working against a deadline. Like, okay, the head's finished, now I just have to do this. Okay, this is finished, now I just have to do that. Um, it's no perfect way to, to do a sculpture, but that's kind of how I like to do it. Do you have any predictions of what they're gonna think or you have any questions of yourself of certain areas or yeah so I I do like to have little mental conversations about okay when they come down here what's the first thing that they're going to notice what are they gonna want to change um, Marsh is the tricky one I, I've gotten a, a, a decent understanding of Ed's um, stylistic preferences I think but Marsha is tricky um, Marcia, you know, has, likes a little more variety, uh, I think. And so, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Um, the one thing I do know, as with every cute character we've done, especially these monster babies, is there's gotta be a butt. There's gotta be some little butt cheeks. Um, because it is, it is adorable. Um, and I know if that wasn't there, that was something that would be mentioned. So that's there. Um, all right, direction. Now the real adult mutant has pretty long and savage hands, but yes. Um, so that will, you know, not be the not be the case with this guy um, for a multitude of reasons. We want him to be a little friendlier than the mutant, um, but also we're gonna, you know, have to paint these much faster than we would paint a mutant. 
Um, and so apart from it being a design choice, um, one of the longest parts about painting a batch of mutants uh, is actually painting the fingers and toes. Um, um, but it can really, really be important to, you know, think about how you might want to paint something, even if it's not the exact colors, but the techniques you might want to use because you can, um, you can use your... I, I could be wrong. We, we have done kind of cartoony stuff and ended up putting uh, more realism-inspired paint jobs on them, and it's ended up looking great. Something me and Ed often do, and I imagine we might do with this guy, is um, we'll have Mondo cast up you know, two or four of them, and Ed and I will each paint uh, one or several copies of the piece uh, with different paint jobs and bring it to everybody and kind of discuss it between ourselves and with Marsha of, okay, what worked on these, what didn't. Every now and then, you know, one of the test paints will be just exactly what it is supposed to be, and, you know, we don't go any further than that. Um, but, uh, we're, we're always trying to, trying to, you know, make sure we're putting out the best product possible. Um, and I would very strongly recommend that if you're at home, um, you know, and you're planning on painting a lot of one thing the same way, if you're making your own masks or something, do a couple different tests and see what you like. Um, because, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it sucks to, you know, already have something in production, you're doing it, and then you see a color scheme that is like, oh, that would have looked so much better on this piece. So I would give yourself time to, to experiment with it and, and see what's going to look best. Think about it as you're sculpting it, but let yourself be surprised too. And you know, one of the things that's kind of cool about the mutant's chest is he has these little kind of stretchy skin flaps that go from his, his shoulder into his chest, um, which is just kind of a cool kind of inhuman feature. And so that might be too much, but you know, it, I, I didn't think it was something cool that harkens it back to the full size mutant in more than just the, the face. We will see what they think about it. Hello. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Tom? Oh, going fantastic. How's it going upstairs? Fantastic. That's what we like to hear. That's all right. Let's see how our little baby mutant's going. Well, he's chubby. Yes. I'm liking his mouth. Let's see. Yeah, it's looking good. Um, he seems kind of big. Compared to? Compared to Greeley, but maybe not. Well, once he gets chiseled down a bit, maybe. He's a biter. He's a biter. <laughs> Uh, well, and if he was a little big, we could always do a generational drop. That yeah. We did that on Greeley. Yeah, somewhere. And the teeth, you know, the teeth are not these teeth. The teeth are... More like those, that. Yeah, with the big separations. I like that. And I like them kind of uneven and things. That's mm -hmm. kind of fun. Yeah, I, I, it looks good. You know, I'm liking the uh, pull on the flesh. You know, that tension is good where um, you feel that, that, you know, it feels natural, like you're, you're stretching skin. Like he's really, Rah! awesome. Nice. Awesome, awesome. I was just so, talking yeah. to Adam about that little feature. Ah. Because um, the, the, the mutant has got those kind of foldy flap things on his, his torso. Is so that I the thought, technical term? Yeah, foldy flap things. Oh, okay. <laughs> On his torso, so I thought it might be kind of cool to to bring it into the to the yeah. Movie. 
No, I agree. Anything you like that, that you can pull, because he's so different, it's nice to, to uh, uh, feel that, yeah, this is a baby version of that. Mm -hmm. You think these little teeth, you'll probably just fill that in back there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the mouth yeah. probably won't be that deep. Yeah, yeah, it shouldn't be. It, that, when you paint it, it just goes yeah. there. Ah. Oh. You got the baby butt crack going oh, yeah. on. <laughs> butt crack. Nice. You know, that's just a classic. Oh, man, you got a big crack. That's like a Mike Glover crack there. Oh. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to damage our youth. Yeah, I like him. He's really looking good. I, I, I wonder if his head's a little fat, maybe? Well, as it gets whittled down, you know. I like how you tipped him up. Because the oh. drawing, drawing wasn't really Yeah, good. yeah, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I, I hadn't noticed that, but yeah. that is good. I am. Yeah. When we do the eyes, uh, you, the eyes will draw you in. But the mouth is what it is. And that's kind of true of this guy, too. It's all about the mouth. And, and, and it's like just this big hole, this cavernous cave. I like the wrinkly diaper, the belly button. Looks good. Yeah. So do you, you think the cute's coming along? So far. Well, cute. I mean, I don't know that I would pick this thing up. <laughs> I would. I would be afraid of being wounded. But, but it. Yeah. It's no. It's cute. It's but they're, they're, all these gremlins are a little edgy. They're just. They got a little bit of. Yeah. A little bit of. A yeah. little bit of bite. But I think that's what people like. Yeah, he's like, hold me, please. But then, yeah. So, uh, since we since we last left off, I've just kind of gone in and uh, worked on the the refinement and the the definition of all these um, shapes and anatomy and uh, you know, kind of just finding the character, which is for something like this and most sculptures is really kind of everything. But finding what shapes look good and finding the character is the difficult part, especially on, on something like this where, you know, we want it to look like an iconic character that we have. And maybe iconic isn't the right word, but certainly to some of our fans seems that way. Um, and make it look cute and... But still not, not too cute, because, you know, we went through multiple different design iterations. Um, but, you know, our, our, our second design was very reminiscent of the mutant in not a great way. Uh -huh. um, he's, he, he's, you know, cute. Well, he not, he, he's, he's going to bite your ankle. He's rambunctious, but he's not really cute. Um... And then we kind of tried to soften those features a little bit and, uh, you know, losing too much of that bone structure and putting these teeth too close together um, really just kind of was not benefiting the design. And so we landed on something like this. And, you know, these are, of course, just kind of starting paths to make sure we go in the right direction. And everyone was pretty happy that this you know, felt reminiscent of the mutant and had a little bit of bite to him, a little bit of, a little bit of uh, rambunctiousness, but was still cute. But yeah, just getting the, getting the character in, um, the, it would be easy for this to just look like a, like a child with sharp teeth as opposed to um, a baby mutant. And we've still got a little bit of refining to do um, but something me and Ed talked about was uh, especially the, the kind of bone structure of the cranium. So we've got these little bulbous bits um, that come out of this. My anatomy teacher would be furious with me right now. I can't remember the name. Uh, but this dip right here, you know, it goes to the dip and then kind of bulbous on the side. And then has an arch here and here and then a little bulbous in the center. Um, and we really wanted to, to kind of carry that into the baby as well. Um, you know, he's got these almost sharp downward cheekbones. Um, and even though, you know, of course he doesn't have the sunken eye sockets on the baby, he's got these 
uh, protruding downward cheekbones, and then, you know, of course he's got just a slight underbite, uh, like his, his big brother, and, um, one of the things that was really, really fun about this, the mutant, although I'm not sure how often you see it because of the clothes, he's got these kind of uh, skin flaps that go from his, his shoulder into his, uh, into his chest. Um, and I thought it would be fun to just try it, thinking that Ed and Marsha would not like it, and I'd probably be kind of scraping it off, but um, they both liked it, and it helps tie it back into uh, the mutant, as opposed to just, you know, like I said, kind of a weird, feral, toothy child. I know this is something we've talked about in past Monster Labs, but can never go over raking enough, and me and Ed were kind of talking about that, so left some of these areas kind of unrefined. You've got, you know, uh, the shape is there, but there's inconsistency this to the shape. Maybe you've got little things like this, or little divots. Um, and raking, especially for a character like this that's almost kind of cartoony, is super important, this kind of refinement. So I'll start with, you know, something fairly big like this. I believe these are Kemper rakes. And I'm just kind of lightly going and I'm crossing the directions so that it's not all going the same way all at the same time. And what this is doing is it's allowing me to see um, and start to take down some of the high points um, that we don't want there. Because you can see some of these lines just cast a little bit more of a shadow than others. And that's what I'm, what I'm looking for when I do this is to kind of even out the shadows in between these cross hatches and you know keeping a, a light hand with it. And the right tool for the right job. Sometimes on a big plane like this a flat rake uh, is good but you know uh, a round rakes works well and works great if you're trying to kind of get into an area like that. Uh-oh. Is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Mutiny. Yeah, because they put E on the end of, of course. You know, kids' names. Yeah. So mutiny's kind of cool. What do you think about these little guys? Oh. Yeah, they're a little low. You think? I was trying to kind of mimic this downward point on the cheekbones here. I know it's not quite right, but just to... Well, I think you still can still like keep mutant. that. I just think this point here has got to go. Yeah. I mean, right. I understand what you're doing. He's yes. he's pulling the flesh, but yeah, it's just a little droopy. All right. I do like that mutant's bone structure. And you're gonna give him that mutant skin texture, right? Oh, it certainly could. I was gonna keep him relatively smooth with some wrinkles. Because he's baby, baby. Yeah, he's a, baby. he's a little more plump and fresh. Yes, <laughs> he's a fresh mutant. Brand spanking new, yeah, as right. they say. Thanks. It looks more natural. I don't think I've added enough. It's not that to see, it's the mutant head. Where yeah, the, why Tom the mutant hid the mutant head for some reason. I don't know, he's over there. Oh. Hiding it from me. I'm just comparing. He's got a bigger <sighs> head than Bailey, for sure. But he will shrink. He will shrink. Yeah, I... He's a little large. But if we had to, we could take him down a generation. Yeah. What else? That navel's pretty crazy. 
<laughs> oh, I need some refinement still. I kind of like it, eh? I think it's like fresh cut. <laughs> yeah, we could have him still have his umbilical cord. No. Oh, yeah. No. Hey, that's, that's a little too much for me. Too, there. My only thought is just trying to make sure it doesn't look like a dog. Yeah. Nothing wrong with dogs. Oh, no. I'm Everybody not. loves those dogs. No, I, I, it, you know, I'm doing this, Tom, but it's, yeah, I do kind of like that better. Um, but it's I, it's not like the end of the world. I just um, this all these super stretch lines are super cool, and this is another one. It really it shows that he is smiling as big as he can. He's so happy to have you for dinner. <laughs> um, any other comments, Marcia? No. No, I like him. Well, let's let's go to finish, Tom. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> More raking and yeah. refining, and then um, once I've got that done, I'll go in um, with water and sponges, and then. Do a little bit of detailing after that. The detailing is, especially on something like this, is super, super fast. And I like to keep a cup of water around for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of which, I like to soak some of my rakes in water when they get gunked up with clay. Um, there are some that I do it on, some that I don't. Um, I do it on these big ones. I'll do it on this, um, but these saw blades rust really fast, so I typically will clean these ones by hand, but um, you know, these big ones, yeah, I don't know what sort of metal they are, but they don't rust, so I just leave them in there until the clay is dissolved. So back to the the cross, that's, so that's kind of an, a good example of what I was talking about where there's a shadow and a peak that's noticeably more than the, the rest of this kind of plane. And so I can kind of go back and forth until it's a little more unified. And that's what we're, we're doing here. It's just unifying the surface and getting rid of high points that we don't want. And just like if you were working with wood, I'll switch to a finer grit, um, which is these wire wrapped ones. I'm almost certain this is a Kemper tool. And the, the very same approach. And depending on how much you want the features to be softened when you go in with your with your water, um, you could leave it here um, for your for your polishing. Um, on something like this that I want to be super smooth, I'll take it a little bit further and use one of these saw blade rakes. Um, Ken's Tools, I believe, made this one. Um, maybe not. It could be Kemper. Um, but what I like to do, I don't know how well you'll be able to see it, is I like to file down the teeth. Um, not completely gone, but just so it's kind of like that. Um, on this end it's not filed down. It's, see, it's just kind of introducing a lot of unnecessary negative space and Sometimes when you go back over that, you can actually trap little air bubbles in the in the clay because of the voids that it creates, and it's a pain in the butt to try and get those out. But I just do the same thing.
Bring it from different directions. Nice. So that's, you know, ready for uh for smoothing with water and sponges right there. Now, just have to do that to everything. Well, so where where are we now? So we are um, really, really close to the finish line. Um, we've got all of the, almost all of the rake marks uh, and tool marks kind of smoothed out and um, polished up. So now we're just kind of going in and, and detailing and finishing the sculpture. Um, which on something like this is really fun because uh, on, on something like the Big Mutant, it is layers and passes of texture and details and wrinkles and little scratches um, to get to the final result. But with this guy, everything's a little more superficial and cartoony, so it rapidly gets finished at this stage. Um, How did you get it from being raked up and smoothed yes. down to this. So if you want to come over here, we can give an example. So I've gone back in just to show you guys the, the approach here and given us some more rake marks. Um, so what you can do, this is something that I have started very, very recently. Um, Jordu requested some of this for a project and he used it and he's pretty smart, so I'm using it and I'm liking it. Um, this is just a, a sanding screen and kind of can kind of just go in and use it to, to take it a little bit further and to get rid of those tool marks and smooth it a little bit more. And then what I like to do, oh, that's no good. That's okay, we can just do that. And what I like to do from here is I take a, uh, a stipple sponge. I like them a little bit on the coarser side and you know, a lot of stipple sponges come in these little tiny things. I don't like those, I like big chunks. Um, and I'll saturate it with water and kind of just buff it out in little circles. And then from here, I'll go for a sponge. Um, Ed, I know, likes natural sponges a lot. I like these, these kind of like car wash sponges um, because these, for the most part, don't leave little particles of the sponge as often as the natural sponges do, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, people may have other experiences, but that is mine, and I'll, I'll kind of stipple this and... What that stippling does is just kind of gets rid of any of the, the kind of strokes that you might see from the sponge. And even if it's not glass smooth, um, makes it register as a much smoother surface. Um, and especially, you know, two pulls out of the mold and this super subtle texture is gone. So now we've got a baby who is like glass smooth. And is the amount of water you put on it, like not too much, not too little, like when you're smoothing, what's your... Yeah, um, it it, it kind of depends on the day. Um, sometimes if something is a little more crude and I'm kind of in a rush to finish it, I'll uh, let the water do a little more of the work and go a little bit wetter. Um, if you, I can kind of show you what happens if you go like too dry. Um, I, I like just enough water for it to, you know, not have a ton of surface tension. And this is a new sponge, so even though this is pretty dry, it's still doing its job very well. Um, yeah, I couldn't get enough water out of this. If, if the sponge is too dry and it's kind of an older sponge, um, it kind of grabs the surface a little more. Um, so I, I like it to kind of just be able to really subtly do its work.
And something that's happening as I'm doing this um, is it's creating a little bit of a slurry uh, with the water and the clay mixing together that's starting to kind of fill in some of my uh, some of my deeper lines and some of my softer lines. And I don't particularly want that, so I'll show you how to take care of that in a second. So now that it's all kind of softened up a little bit, I'll take this and I'll just get real close and kind of blast away that slurry. And so I'm left with, uh, you know, a more polished set of teeth that doesn't have the details um, diluted uh, from that slurry because the, the slurry kind of just shoots away. And same thing, I'm just gonna soften these, not too much, because again, we're going for a little cartoony, but I'm just gonna soften some of these wrinkles a little bit. And, um, and you can kind of use that to your advantage um, for the final kind of polishing and smoothing. It tends to, to go a little bit easier and not get as, as kind of brushy as this. Is that change of color in the clay? In sculpture? Uh, just because it's a little more difficult to read your shapes if there are other things in the way that are kind of preventing you from doing that light. That's because, you know, it, when, when the water sits in a little crevice like that, of course it starts to kind of mix with the clay and then that takes a real long time to, to get back to a, a workable state. So a little preventative stuff can be good if you got the time. Uh, going back to, to the sandpaper analogy, uh, a makeup sponge with alcohol instead of water is kind of like the finest grit that I go to with, uh, with a wet clay sculpture. And um, the alcohol uh, breaks surface tension really easily, but still performs uh, similarly to the water, except it just evaporates away really quick so you don't have a, a kind of slimy soft surface as you're smoothing. And so I am just, uh, these ones are really nice. I used the, um, the kind of, uh, um, I, I'm not sure how important it is. The hands are bugging me a little bit as far as pulling out. Have you, have you talked to uh, Mondo yet? Should um, I go get him? Yeah, go get him. Yeah, yeah let's get He him. was down here talking to me. With oh, camera, okay. But So we are just putting the, the finishing touches on this guy before we start to prepare him for mold making. Um, just kind of as a, as a recap of the, the stages we've gone through with the sculpture, you know, of course Ed, uh, Ed blocked it in and got some of the largest shapes there. And uh, I took over and started kind of putting in some of the anatomy and refining the forms and just taking it further. Um, once that is finished, we get to, we get to start the, the process of adding in some secondary form and continuing to refine and start to rake those shapes down to blend everything in. And then we've gone in with the, uh, the stipple sponge and combinations of water and alcohol and other sponges to kind of start to smooth everything out and polish it up a little bit. 
and then we've gone in with our with our fine detail and our our final kind of form fit and polish um, with alcohol and the makeup sponges and the soft brushes um, and so that's got us to where we are now which is uh, a, a visually complete sculpture um, and so the next part in this baby mutants uh, stage of development is I'm gonna go in and just make things a little bit easier on Mondo um, so I'll add some clay to the back of each of these teeth so that the latex can flow out of them easier. Um, I filled in these nostrils a little bit so they're not quite as shallow and prone to having the plaster break in there. And then we are going to um, spray this sculpture with a gloss spray paint. Um, we like to use um, Ace Hardware's uh, Gloss Leather Brown, um, and we'll, we'll give it a, a few, you know, pretty, pretty substantial coats of that um, to, to seal in the sculpture really well. And we'll make a clay wall that will become the dividing point between the two mold halves, and then make the plaster mold So do you think you accomplished kind of cute, but also elements of the mutant? I would say so. Um, you know, I, I think he's cute. Um, I, I think he fits in very well with the existing line, which is something that we try to keep in mind. Um, but I think he is recognizable as a, as an iteration of the Distortions Mutant. 